With no further ado, I'm going to introduce our beautiful panel. So our first guest is Angela Pippos, who you probably all know because she's a celebrated sports broadcaster, journalist. Come on, Angela. Come on, do it. <laughs> She spent 14 years at the ABC, but is now enjoying the freedom and diversity of freelancing, and her career is going from strength to strength. In the last month, her documentary about the rise of women in football, a league of her own, screened nationally on the Seven Network, and she released her latest book, Breaking the Mold, Taking a Hammer to Sexism in Sport. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Next, I'd like to ask Halima to come up. Um, Halima Mohammed is the chairperson of Skilling Employment and Aid Enterprises Australia. <laughs> she's a community leader. <laughs> That's my girl. Um, she's a community leader and activist from Melbourne's western suburbs, born in Somalia, where she worked in Parliament for over a decade. She came to Australia in 2003. Just four years later, she was inducted into the Victorian Honour Roll of Women for her work in Melbourne's Somali community. Very impressive. Very impressive. And last but certainly not least, and Jira, I'll ask you to take this seat at the end, um, is Jira Lula Harvey, who is the founder of Kalinya Communications, a boutique marketing and events firm established to promote positive images of Aboriginal. Oops, oops, oops. Um, um, <laughs> positive images of Aboriginality. In the language of her grandmother, a proud Yorta Yorta matriarch from Northern Victoria. Kalinya, which is the name of her company, translates to good, beautiful, and honest. Jira is a national scholar of the University of Melbourne, where she now guest lectures on representations of race and sexuality in Australian pop culture. She has been awarded a centenary medal for creative contributions to Australian society. So I think you can hear we've got quite a <laughs> Okay, I want to start with you, Angela. Okay. Just because you're the pocket rocket over there. Mm -hmm. um, so this is Melbourne, and of course, um, we had an important barrier broken in women's footy as of late. Yep. So I want you to tell us a little bit about what happened and what was so momentous about it. Okay. AFLW, um, fans in the audience, who loves it? In my 20 years as a sports journalist, it is the most exciting thing to happen. Australian football is in our blood. It is our national sport. It's our Indigenous game. And women have been excluded for the best part of 100 years. Women have played this great game of ours sporadically, though. So when men went to war, women filled in. They played some exhibition games. But there was never any movement to give them their own competition until the 1980s when some courageous and fabulous women started the Victorian Women's Football League. And back then, society frowned upon them. They weren't encouraged to play. It was this sort of dirty secret. So Debbie Lee, who I interviewed in the documentary, said to me, she felt embarrassed and ashamed to play footy in the 1980s because she got this this feeling from society that, that she was doing something wrong. But Debbie Lee and these other great women kept playing. Um, the competition grew, um, but it was only in Victoria. So what happened here with the establishment of AFLW is huge because it is an elite national competition for women. Women have always loved this game, but the game hasn't always reciprocated the love to them. So it's been an emotional summer for me, and I'm sure many of you have felt it as well, because it's bigger than football. What we've seen is something much bigger. It is about staring convention in the face and bringing about some change. And because it was a lockout crowd, wasn't it? Well, Isn't the opening night mm. at Prince's Park was a lockout. So um, the AFL underestimated the crowd. Women are always underestimated. Um, <laughs> I knew it was going to be big, and I knew it was going to be big because friends of mine who don't even like the sport were turning up on this night because it was about something bigger. And when my girlfriends turn up to the footy, you know that something is on. Something is happening <laughs> that's so, bigger than sport. So does it mean we're home and hosed? Does this mean, like, the barriers are down and now we can just carry on without any barriers to women in sport? No, we're not, we're not there yet. We're heading in the right direction. Clearly there is... Um, the pay disparity. And on that issue, I'll, I'll say it up front and early, they are not paid enough. But I do applaud the AFL for creating a competition 
um, to be sustainable because what we, we want is this thing to go on for hundreds and hundreds of years. So to run it for eight weeks before the blokes run out is the right thing to do because, you know, it would have been difficult for women to get any headlines while the men's AFL is, is happening. So it's eight weeks, it's on now. The crowds have been magnificent. It's been played at smaller venues, um, great atmosphere. Media coverage. Media coverage, sponsors. And we talk about stories, about women's stories being hidden. We've always had great stories for women in sport, but we just haven't known about them. Mm. So now we're, we're learning about um, you know, Moana Hope and, and uh, Melissa Hickey and these great women. Um, you know, their stories are no longer hidden. So the whole thing has been fantastic. I've cried every week. Um, <laughs> I'm so moved by it. And it's, it's about social change. And, um, you know, I, I applaud the AFL because Gillan McLaughlin brought the competition forward three years. I know, Leslie, AFL's not your, your specialist subject. Um, <laughs> but just to let you know that this was slated for 2020, this league. And Gil decided to bring it forward three years. Now, he took um, a bit of a punt here. He didn't know if society was ready. He didn't know if, his, if the world of football was ready for it. But... It was an act of courage and he did it. Because we all know that if we don't intervene, if we wait for things to happen organically as women, it never happens. Like you well, actually eventually need. someone had to take a risk. Yes. Now, Jerry, you're a bit of a footy fan too, which I, <laughs> under, which I sort of discovered when I was Facebook stalking you as this is the job of a panel <laughs> presenter. Um, so what makes you so passionate about sport um, in general and footy in particular? Sure, I am just learning. But um, I guess before I speak, I, I would like to pay my respects to the traditional custodian of the land on which we stand. Um, we're on shared country here of the Wurundjeri and the Bunurong people of the Kulin Nation. I've been lucky enough to be raised on, on Kulin country um, and I pay my respects to their elders and also my own and I wanted to pay particular respect to the line of strong women that I come from. Um, I'm not sitting up here by myself and I was reflecting actually when I was sitting there and looking at my name at what a feminist name I have. Um, my last name Harvey is my mum's name. Um, my my, um, my father's name is Bamblett and we have a really strong name in the Aboriginal community and so people are often like how come your last name's Harvey and it's because my mum said my daughter's going to carry forward my name. Um, my mum she was uh, very involved in the feminist movement. Um, she helped establish the first women's refuges for young women escaping abuse. She worked um, on the establishment of the prostitutes collective and for advocating for the rights of street workers. My first name, Jira, is um, Gunai Kurnai. It means kangaroo. Uh, kangaroo are the only species of Australian animal that has increased in numbers since colonisation. And so my mum said, if you are going to be an Aboriginal woman um, wanting to create change, wanting to live a big life in a white patriarchal country, you're going to need to be resilient like the kangaroo. <laughs> um, and Lala is my middle name, my, my grandmother's name. Lala Morgan is a Yorta Yorta matriarch. She raised her 14 kids um, at Rumbalara and Kamragunja Mission. Uh, she raised the, her 14 children with a, a respect for community, for education, and from them, there are now over 500 direct descendants, um, many of which are CEOs and board members. And I would guess that at least there's a 50-50 split between female and male CEOs and board members. So I've been raised amongst um, a strong female leadership. Um, well, in fact, <laughs> you said that to me. That's fantastic. <laughs> Let's skip the question about sport. Because you said that to me when we, when we initially spoke, you said, in fact, all my aunties are CEOs. So yeah. tell us a little bit more about your, your family and your yeah, background. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, I think, um, I guess I really didn't feel um, the glass ceiling as a woman. You feel the glass ceiling as an Aboriginal person every step you take in this country. Um, but I didn't really feel it as a woman until I started um, looking at more senior roles within, within corporate structures because for me, growing up in community, we're surrounded by strong women. We're surrounded by female CEOs. They, they run our organisations. My, my aunties are pastors. They, they, they marry our family members. They, um, they're CEOs. They head up the orgs. They speak at the events. Um, in, in my world, women run things. 
Yeah. <laughs> Which is great. That's exactly what you want. Um, and is it, is it accurate to say or inaccurate to say um, that Aboriginal culture has become matriarchal? I think, um, I mean, there, there's many Aboriginal cultures. We definitely think of Australia as a, as a continent rather than a country. There's, there's um, over 500 Aboriginal nations and, and each have their own distinct cultural practices. But we often refer to our culture as, as matriarchal. Um, we, many of us take on the lineage of our, of our grandmothers. Um, and, yeah, and, and I think that... Um, that traditionally many of our cultures were, um, well, tradition, I have trouble with the word traditionally, um, pre-colonisation, many of our cultures were matriarchal, but even post-colonisation, you know, through, through colonisation, you, you, it's a process of disempowering men as well as women, and so women have to step up into very, very strong roles when racism holds Aboriginal men back from um, certain positions in society. Often women have to step up in different ways, and so I think we have, yeah, we have, we have strong leadership coming kind of pre and post. Mm. You know. Which is really good to see. And Halima, you, you are very interested in, in strong leadership. Um, you're, you're yourself an amazing story, which I think, you know, if you want to do um, what Jira's just done and tell us a little bit more about yourself, I think that would be wonderful to hear. Um, just how, how, did you, how did you arrive on this stage? Tell us a short version of the journey of how you got um, here with us today. Thank you very much. Good morning, everyone, and congratulations on International Women's Day, all of you. And I come in Australia in 2003. It was not an easy journey. It was a very long journey to come to reach this stage. We come from Africa. Africa is a very big continent. It is not a country, it is a big continent, and it has different cultures, and it has different languages, and it has lots of women who migrated in this beautiful country. So when I come here, and I, my background is really to work with the community, and I will always support in supporting to, in our country to the young people and the women. I feel, I felt when you, f you, you, you empower a woman, you empower whole the family. So when I come here, I really become very sick for the first year, and I was in, in a hospital, and I was thinking, in Halima, what are you going to do if you survive this? I have a very beautiful sister, her name is Sarah. And she always talks to me and says, Halima, you will survive and you will do what you wanted to do within this community because we left our country without nothing and we come a country which everything is strange, which is the language you know, I had for you and the environment, even the food, even the culture. So you can feel how it's very hard when you reach that. Uh, stage. What I find out, a lot of African women is in here, and we'll, we, I know how the women are important. Uh, their role is very important within our community, and we have very different cultures, very rich culture to pass on. So, and I decided just how the the way, the only way you can help is to go to and uh, support, empower women. And that's why I decided to work with the women. And starting that, I felt a lot of women who are skilled, some are uh, educated, some have uh, you know, very good experience, though they're not educated, but they have very good experience. So all this, if we take out and we grasp it, the real goodness of our culture, and we add uh, this our new country that will be I felt it will be great so in this case I decided to just to say start your work with working with the woman empowering women and I feel if we empower women we empower all the family mm. good well, I think everyone would agree with that and so the particular initiative you're working on with the City of Melbourne is called the Empowering Women Initiative. So can you tell us a little bit about that? An Empowering Women Initiative 
uh, created by, with, with the African woman in the city of Melbourne. And really, it was beautiful an initiative which we, fe which we feel that we are getting what we needed to empower women and to give the chance that they can support their wider community is great. So we started and we decided to bring 30 women in our community and 28 succeeded to finish a leadership, high level leadership course with RMIT. And these 28 women now are ready to take this experience and this in, in beautiful understanding of how the leadership works to the mainstream community and especially in African community. So and there's some of those women here today. Yeah, aren't they, they already. Yes. Do you want to put your hands up? <laughs> <laughs> well done. Yes. Good stuff. Um, so empowerment, that's, that's obviously a key word when we come to um, think about International Women's Day. We all want empowerment. We're not so um, excited about paternalism. Um, I know <laughs> that's so a particular excited. bugbear of yours. T tell me why we don't want paternalism and, and what we're looking for is empowerment. I mean, I don't think anyone wants paternalism. I think as women, we all understand what that sounds like. Um, it's definitely, yeah, it's one of, it's one of my frustrations. Um, I... I I used to be a young Aboriginal woman in the business world. I'm not feeling so young anymore. But yeah, paternalism is something that I think can hold us back a lot. And in terms of empowerment, um, it's empowerment of our, our young women that I'm really passionate about. You know, I think that um, young Aboriginal women have, have survived a lot. You know, we carry intergenerational strength, but we also carry intergenerational trauma with us. Um, and... So I'm really passionate about working with our young ones, particularly in this era of popular culture when there is this kind of love of, but dismissive love, fetishized love of, um, of the brown body and of, of uh, women of colour. And you look on the television and, and women of colour are there more than they ever have been before, but they're there half naked. Um, and you can... You can switch on any form of media and see beautiful, exotic-looking brown women, um, but you will keep switching and switching and switching until you find somebody, a beautiful brown woman, who is reading the news or is having an opinion on current affairs. And so I think empowerment of our, our young women now is really, really important because we're starting to... Um, have some role models, but we need we need more in the media. We need more images. We need more women with voices in the media. Mm. And there's there's fetishising of women's bodies in sport too, isn't oh, there? Just a little bit. <laughs> <laughs> Empowering women in sport. It, it starts with valuing women in sport. We need to value our women athletes as much as we value our male athletes. Um, and that's kind of where it's all gone wrong historically. Is that sport? and masculinity have gone hand in hand going back to ancient Greek times when at the Olympics um, women weren't allowed to compete but they also couldn't go along and watch um, but of course the maidens could go along and watch so if you were unmarried and available you mm. could go and watch uh, the men compete in the nude at the Olympics um, and I think about those, those maidens as they were called they were almost like the first cheerleaders in sport. So we've always had women on the sidelines watching men perform all these great feats. Um, so yeah, sport and masculinity have been doing a merry dance since ancient times. So for women and in sport... Haven't you also spoken um, about this issue about, you know, the way even women are um, allowed to appear in terms of their bodies and in terms of what they wear, like the frilly tennis skirt is kind of yes. okay, but when you're looking at women in, in less feminine types of sports right. and less feminine um, outfits, it's not... It yes, jars so, a bit more. Yes. Um, Sexploitation of women athletes is a big problem to... It's almost like it's okay if you're competing, but you have to still be feminine as well. And this is why in the book I make the point that in tennis, tennis hasn't really pushed the boundaries like these traditionally masculine sports. So in tennis, you're not really offending too many people if you're running around in a frilly skirt. Um, and, you know, it's a different 
question entirely if you're a woman who wants to play cricket or one of the football codes um, because they are the more masculine sports. So there are, there are differences. But what um, is a, happens across the board is that women athletes are... Um, exploited because of their sex. So if you're a woman who's prepared to do a nude calendar, uh, you're going to get more support, more followers because you're, you know, living up to the feminine stereotype. Um, if you don't play that game, you'll be hidden. And, you know, some women in sport do it willingly and I'm, I'm all for women making their own decisions and their own choices about this. But there are some sports that force women to promote themselves that way. Um, and I'm thinking about those sporting codes where women have, you know, had to convert to wearing, you know, the, the lycra outfit to get more eyeballs, to get more people watching. You know, uh, it never works. There may be a spike in interest, but what we, the sporting public, want, we want to see our women athletes doing what they do, and that is running around playing sport and winning, and they do it well. Our women have done it so well on the, on the world stage. So when those sports do try and put women into different outfits, um, when, um, you know, uh, women golfers lie in a bathtub naked full of golf balls, you know, there, there's a little bit of interest for five <laughs> minutes, but then it disappears. You know, then, then it's back to, you know, we're all watching men's sport. So I, I give the example of the Matildas. And they did a nude calendar in, I don't know when it was, 2000. Spike in interest. But then the same old, um, you know, sexist attitudes come back. When the Matildas took us on that wild ride to the quarterfinals of the World Cup and they beat Brazil and they became household names and, and we actually saw them play and we celebrated them and we heard their stories, that's when things start to change. You know, the, the, the random nude calendar, it's not going to work. We need to, we need to promote our women athletes properly. We need to have the will to change things. Mm. Um, it's no good burying women's sport at 11.30 p.m. On a, on a Tuesday night. You know, you've, if you're going to do it, do it properly. Mm. And once again, a tick to the AFL for, for getting, you know, getting things mostly right. Mm. Um, you know, the, we need... Women have to be visible in sport, you know, as men do in sport. The yeah. only way you're going to get a following is if you actually see them and give but them a chance dress, to get a following. How we dress is a constant, isn't it? It's a constant subject of interest. I, I remember Joan oh. Kerner speaking about when she first became um, the premier. She uh, kept talking about... There was a, a cartoon that the councillors are laughing because they know all about this. They kept depicting her, a cartoonist kept depicting her in a polka dot dress. And finally, the, the cartoonist got asked, you know, why, why do you keep depicting me in this cartoon dress? Because I, I don't have a polka dot dress and I've never had a polka dot dress and I wouldn't have one. Um, and he said, oh, I, I just don't know how to draw you. You know, so I think this, this constant issue of how we dress, is that something that comes up for you in, in your day-to-day -day working life, Halima? Um, really, the happiness sometimes to see a person who dresses whatever, the woman dresses whatever she wants, but sometimes you meet some people who are judging you and telling you how you dress or how you don't dress and mm. how you walk and that's not fair and woman it's not for the woman no for the woman is not fair to to meet that so they have free life they have to do what they enjoy their life mm. it's your life yes it's your life it's your life so how you dress is yes, your choice it's your, it's your body your your dress so Even when I was on the ABC anchoring the sport for, for 10 years, I had a, a full drawer of letters from people writing in about my hair. Like it, it was this sort of big issue that, um, oh, I liked your hair the other night. It was better on Tuesday than it was on Friday. You know, and like not listening to what I'm saying, but talking about my hair. I had a um, uh, someone from a commercial network who was talking to me about perhaps switching over there and he said that my side part was too pronounced. I thought, God, I'm a dark-haired woman. I'm going to have a part that you can actually see and I'm not turning blonde for anybody. <laughs> well, I think, I think you could see the entire Hillary, Hillary Clinton career in the public space as a, a, a long-running commentary on her haircut. Absolutely. And this, mm -hmm. this is, this is a, just a, a frustration of mine. And, I'm, and I started writing the book out of frustration. 
thankfully it turned into something more positive because we're starting to see change and that's reflected in the book. But, you know, this, this, this focus on, on women in sport, that's my world, but women more broadly, on the way we look. It's like our value is attached to our looks rather than anything else. Mm. Sport is, yeah, like any other sector in society, it's a real battle to see the athlete first before the... The, the, the beauty. Mm. Yeah. So I'm going to read something because we have, you know, obviously when you talk about issues for women, you have to talk about the upside and the downside. But I want to end with the comment all of you, I'm going to ask all of you to make about something that was in uh, the paper the other day. And it was a quote from Liz Ellis. So do you guys know who Liz Ellis is? Former um, Australian netball captain. Um, and she sometimes is on, cha she, apparently she's going to be on Channel 9 soon commentating um, on sport. But she was asked, uh, uh, I th maybe possibly around International Women's Day, I'm not sure, she was asked a question and this is a story that she told. She said, there's a bit of a talk at the moment about how women's sport is an overnight success and I don't mind that. It really came home to me during the Olympics last year. I was lying in bed with my five-year-old daughter and we were watching the television flicking between the opals female basketballers, the Matildas, female soccer players, and the Pearls, our gold medal winning women's rugby team. And we were watching all these women going around playing team sports and my little girl turned to me and she said, Mommy, why don't boys play sport? <laughs> <laughs> and I said, my darling, that's because they're ironing. <laughs> A few minutes later, she said, Mommy, what's ironing? <laughs> and I thought, my work here is done. <laughs> so <laughs> I have to say that of all the things that I have read this International Women's Day, that gave me the most heart. <laughs> so, yeah. um, so I might just um, ask you to, to, well, to thank all my beautiful guests. Please, please, please thank all my beautiful guests. And there is now a roving microphone, so instead of me asking them questions, the, the panel isn't over, you just get to ask them questions. Uh, thanks, great presentation. Um, given sport is definitely a business, and a lot of money involved, and television rights, and things like that, and I think it is fantastic to see women's sport taking lead. However, I think it would be interesting to get your opinion on when it comes to the revenues, how that's going to play out, particularly for the Women's League, given their first mm. game was free. So will people pay? Will the television pay? Will the rights be there? So I'd be interested in your thoughts on that. There is a lot of momentum here for women's AFL. There's no doubt about that. And when I was filming the documentary, I got out and about for you know the best part of a year going to local clubs. So I can see it's coming through. The sport is growing. The fastest growing segment of the game is, is girls' footy. Uh, so I've got no doubt that it's, it's only going to get stronger because you've also got to consider that a number of the women playing in the AFLW now had the pathway ripped out from under their feet from the age of 14 to 18. They went and played other sports. The girls who are going, who have gone along to the footy with Mo Hope's name on the back of their jumper, which is just beautiful to see, they will have a pathway. So they will keep playing their chosen sport and um, the skill level will increase because of that. So it is going to get stronger. Um, two schools have thought about it being free. Um, look, it's probably the right thing to do for the opening season to get people there to see it and to see that it's entertaining, to see that these women are physical and it's okay for women to be physical. <laughs> so, you know, dispelling all those myths. Um, but you, I think going forward, the competition, they'll, they'll, there'll be more teams, there'll be an entry fee, and it will start to sort of be normal football. Um, on the whole sponsorship thing, I have a real problem with the argument that's been thrown at me for 20 years, that the market never lies. Now, the, where that argument is flawed is that the market isn't this thing operating in a vacuum. The market is also patriarchal, uh, the decisions are made based on this assumption that men's sport is more entertaining, they are stronger, they are faster and all that stuff. So I don't buy that, that market argument and I also just finally, I take hope that AFLW has attracted some really good sponsors. 
these sponsors want to align their brand with something progressive, something that's good for society, that empowers girls, that makes girls feel more comfortable about their bodies, and the whole thing is great. So, you know, all you have to do is explain to companies that if you have these values in your workplace, get on board women's sport because, you know, you can align your product with something that's bloody good and get in now because it's only going to become more expensive get in it early and support it and you know and yeah change your mindset yes most of the time men are stronger and faster but who cares you know i've sat through men's sport and i've fallen asleep you know it's not always entertaining either so you know just recognize the contest Sp the, whether a sport is boring or not it depends on the contest not on the sex of the person playing the sport. Absolutely. So yeah, I think sponsors need to, to start seeing it differently. Yeah. Right. Terrific. Any other questions? Hi. It um, was good and fantastic uh, program. Thank you for organising it. My question is to G Jira. Is that right? Yeah. Um, I am asking this question because you are a young uh, woman from you are Australian but different culture, like raised in uh, different culture. What advice would you give us or to our young women struggling in Australia, not only because they are different uh, in color, they are wearing a hijab, mm -hmm. uh, we are trying to raise them that you can be, the sky is the limit. But mm -hmm. you open the news, you see everywhere what people bombarding with this wrong information and, and making you believe like you are like nothing, object. Yeah. So what would you advise? Like they go to university, they're facing a lot of discrimination mm. issues, public transport everywhere. So what advice would you give to us to, for ourselves and for our uh, young generations? Great oh, question. Great question. Thank you. Um, I would also like to adhere advice from you. You know, I think, I think that's the answer is us sharing information. You know, that um, Australia... Australia is a very racist country. It's a very, very racist country and, and I think it's something that we find very hard to talk about and very hard to admit here. Um, but the more that women of colour can join together and share information about how you survive day to day in a country where your identity is challenged all the time, where your religion is challenged, where your sexuality, um, the worth of your body, the worth of your... Um, of your femininity is challenged constantly. I think the more that we can share those tools and have conversations because while we are, you know, Aboriginal people are 0.9% of the population in Melbourne. So that makes Aboriginal women maybe 0.5-ish percent of the population. So the more we connect with young Somali women and the more we connect with young women um, of, of colour around here, we're, we're less of a minority and we can, we can learn from each other. Do we have any more questions? I disagree with that because I think I've lived all over the world and um, I think on the whole everyone just takes people as they are. They don't even look at their colour, they don't look at where they come from and I disagree because Australia is a very, very open country and everyone that comes here is welcomed as long as we're prepared to put in some effort. But okay, we'll, we'll take that as a comment. Thanks. <laughs> Any other questions? Could I just say as well, to sure. follow that up, I'm going to Iran in next month and I have to wear a scarf and I went into the South Yarra post office uh, in my uh, scarf and headwear and I thought, oh, I wonder if anybody's going to say anything. And they just smiled or walked past. I don't think the prejudice there. I think it's in the eye of the beholder too. So there, thank you. Do you, do you want to make a comment? Yeah. I mean, I think, wait a minute, Let, let's hear from Jira and then we'll take some more comments and questions from the audience. So feel free to make a comment. I mean, obviously. I guess I guess this is 
For me, um, for this is one of the reasons that we need to create safe spaces for women of colour to have these conversations, because um, if we feel that we can't talk about the discrimination that we face on a day-to-day -day basis, then it makes it really hard to network and to kind of talk to each other about how we're going to deal with it, how we're going to stay strong, how we're going to move forward. And so when people kind of question the need for us to have Indigenous-only spaces or spaces where women of colour can come together and um, brainstorm ideas. I guess that's why it's important for us because everybody has their own experience of Australia, but this is our experience of Australia and it's really important for us to be able to connect on that. Mm. I, I might also ask Halima to make a comment. Do you want to make a comment about your experience? Um, really what I felt when I come here was to be part of a mainstream community and to welcome. There are people who they divided, really the community divided. Some are supporting you and giving you the nurture you needed. And some are aggressive and other side. So when I see someone who is, when they see your color or your scarf or the way that you are dealing with the people, jumps on you and says something, I just see, look at the other side, those good people who are doing great. So I, don't, I never give up to say this can do something because there are a huge community members who are trying to normalize everything and to be, to, to be uh, welcoming you. And these people, they need really the, the people who are racist or doing in, in, in comments that you don't need. They need to hear from the big, big in, 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 uh, government uh, members or the members of the parliament the, the good words that they need to hear. So sometimes you can have some narrow-minded people when they hear someone is talking about bad things in the radio or television, then they jump in and say, yes, that's something existing, and they run on the uh, roads, and you can get some people who are intimate, uh, intim making intim intimidation. So in that case, we need to support each other because we are, as a, as a, a colored people or as a, a, a different people who come from an immigrated this country, we need nurturing. The, the, these people, they have been through a lot. And they need, when they meet a people in this country, and I call home now. I don't feel I have another home now. So I, I, they need nurturing. They need uh, just the guiding or t just the letting know that those people who believe they, we, uh, the, the other, these other people are attacking something. No. We have a very rich country. We are beautiful people. We have uh, people who are standing with you. Really, no one can survive alone. If we bring our things, if we, if we bring our rich uh, culture, in this country, we need to be part of And some uh, uh, people who are coming to this country, they have their negative side too. So what I feel is we need not the, the, the people, we need the high level of the government to, instead of talking in a negative way, because they are leading us. They are, they are our electorate. We are give the vote. So we need to hear from them a very good comment is about how we can help each other. But if you say these people are taking our things, these are dressing bad, this is doing this, that kind of thing is created. There are people who don't have that big you know, vision mm -hmm. and see that's right and they jump on you and, and that's where we lost. So sometimes you feel I take, I want you to ask someone to support me. I'm doing a, an African women's programs. I want you to get and hear from the community members and to support me because this is new for me. The culture is new for me. The, uh, the, the, uh, and, and the language is new for me. The, even the, the, the weather is new for me. So I need people who can say yes, they come from this long journey and they need uh, the support of the whole community 
But when you get some negative and, 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 and voices in the radio or television, and you hear that very big person or government body, you can feel there is, there is some people who are taking that, clicking and taking that and jumping on you. And, and you cannot all the time say, you know, fight that and say, no, it's not right. Who's right? The government is saying that. Mm. You come here. So we need the community support to, to, to flourish and to reach our potential and to support our community because we don't have, we don't call other villages home. This is our home now. And we need that in the community. If there is some negativity, then we have to, I feel really when I see some negative person, I don't take, uh, I don't generalize. I say this is his personality, he did this, this person. But we need a support for the community, with the community. Yes. And to have, you know, say within the community. And that's where we can, we can say we can take our culture, our real culture, our uh, and, and understanding, our uh, happiness to this beautiful country. And it will be very good tapestry for, the, for our culture. And, yeah. and, and uh, this is multicultural country. We are multicultural country. And we have different people with different thinking. Really, 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 I'm so proud to be part of, mm. of, 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 of Australia community. I'm so proud of it. But we don't, we don't want it. We don't want it. Those who are discriminating and creating bad stuff within our women or our uh, community to say, stop what you are doing and do the right thing. So we can support each other. Yeah, thank, thank you. you. <laughs> thank you. We do need, we do need better leadership. I, I absolutely agree with you. Um, but I need you to just um, help me to welcome Councillor Sullivan um, up to the podium just to close out the event. Um, and then we will um, finish it off with some eating and flowers and all that stuff. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Leslie, um, and thank you all for being here today. Um, I would like to, uh, before I begin, I would like to pay my respects to the traditional owners of the land, and they are the traditional owners of the land, the Kulin Nation, and pay my respects to elders both past and present. It is my privilege to thank today's speakers on behalf of the City of Melbourne. Dr. Leslie Cannon, Cannold, sorry. Uh, love a good Facebook stalk. Miss <laughs> um, Angela Pipos, uh, I, I agree that, you know, uh, the, that girls are so important and the role that they play in sports. Sports in particular, I think, is a, a universal language um, and that is something I think is very, very important platform for women. Miss um, Halima Mohammed, Miss Jira Lula Harvey, uh, I wanted to make some commentary, actually, um, because uh, I'm not Aboriginal, but I am half Asian and I'm half Australian. My father is Thai Chinese. My mother, who is here today, is Australian. And I think it's a very important thing to say that culture is important and valuing other people's culture is important. Uh, and when there is an injustice, such as what has happened in the past, it is important that we say sorry and that we resolve it and that we continue to fight for equality for all cultures. These strong women today have shared with us their diverse experience, expertise and perspective and given us all great insight into what gender equity looks like in 2017, as well as what it can and should like look like in the very near future. I have lived in Melbourne for 17 years. I grew up in Bangkok, Thailand. Um, it was a time, you know, of, um, it was a third world country at the time. It was, um, I was surrounded by, by poverty, uh, injustice, homelessness. Women in Thailand um, at the time, and what I believe is now, really don't have a lot of opportunities. Um, and I remember there, there was a very real fear growing up that um, because I was a, a, what they call um, a Lukung, which is I'm, I'm half Thai, half Australian, so we were sort of deemed a bit more valuable. 
So um, there was a real threat that we would be either taken and a, a limb would be cut off to get you know, some extra sympathy and we would become beggars or that we would be sold into some sort of sex trafficking industry. And these are very real threats and they are still there today. I remember coming to Australia and being amazed when I took a shower that you could drink the water and thinking, you guys just let this go down the drain? Like, there's people in Thailand that, you know, you couldn't drink out of the river, you would get typhoid or you would catch some disease. And I remember thinking, you know, going to school that, wow, education is free and everything's so clean. When I used to go to school and there was children begging on the side of the school bus door, so I think Australia is a great country, and I think it is a multicultural country, but I think that we can do more. And I feel like some of the comments tonight reflect that we can do better. As chair of the City of Melbourne, I am the City for People portfolio, which is something I'm really proud of. We have over 200 nationalities in the City of Melbourne. Um, we have about a hundred and, oh, it's like 190 languages. It, there's, a, there's a huge amount. Um, and I'm committed to continuing our good and practical work in this area. Part of my portfolio encompasses women's equity and multiculturalism, and we do a lot of work with domestic violence. And events such as this, International Women's Day, is very important in highlighting just how... As, as my wonderful councillor Cathy Oak has said, just how we're doing well, but we could be doing better. Um, I'm raising two daughters, and I think it is really important for them to know their value. And I'm raising a son. He's actually here today, he's sick, and I think like most women, we do the juggle. Um, so I've got him here at work, but I think it's also very important that he is raised to respect women. So before I end, I just think I might let you in on a little secret. It's called Married at First Sight. And I don't know if you guys have seen it. But there was a, an episode lately, um, because, you know, us politicians, we like to watch really highbrow things. Um, and there was an episode recently, and I think there was a comment about boys will be boys, and I think we hear about boys club, and I think we hear about things such as that. And as one of the three women on a councillor full of men, um, my bold change message would be that there are no boys or girls clubs, that gender is no longer an issue, that people are seen on merit and not on sex. Thank you for coming today.